Lord, uh, let's sing this old song. What do you think about Jesus? What do you think about Jesus? He's all right. What do you think about Jesus? He's all right. What do you think about Jesus? He's all right. All right. All right. All right. What do you think about the Father? He's all right. What do you think about the Father? He's all right. What do you think about the Father? He's all right. All right. All right. All right. What do you think about the Holy Ghost? He's all right. What do you think about the Holy Ghost? He's all right. What do you think about the Holy Ghost? He's all right. All right. All right. All right. What do you think about Jesus? He's all right. What do you think about Jesus? He's all right. What do you think about Jesus? He's all right. All right. All right. All right. Can you say amen, everybody? <laughs> I'm not sure how you say amen in one of these parking lot services, amen. apart from flashing your lights. I really don't want folks blowing their horn, per se. So <laughs> glory to God. But we give God the glory this morning. He's brought us this far by faith. We believe that everything's in God's hands, and we serve a mighty God. Let's sing, What a Mighty God We Serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. They must adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. Jesus is the God we serve. Jesus is the God we serve. Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. Jesus is the God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. We're going to be looking in our Bibles today to the book of St. John, the 14th chapter. We'll take a moment here to adjust and, and to uh, get this guitar over on the other side, and then we'll get into the scriptures today. As I said, we're looking to St. John chapter number 14 as we read a passage that's very comforting to us as believers. This is very familiar to us, of course, as Jesus said that in verse number one, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you shall know him and have seen him. As we come before the Lord this morning and honoring his name in preaching the gospel, we do so, of course, uh, hoping to encourage every believer. And I love the fact that Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. And then later on in this chapter, in the 27th verse, he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. At the beginning of this uh, passage of scripture and at the end of this scripture, both times he said, let not your heart be troubled. And in between he gave them several reasons why that they do not have to be troubled. He gave them some of the greatest reasons, and it's reasons that you and I can enjoy and appreciate this morning. Uh, we can think on, of course, the fact that Jesus himself faced many things that caused him to be troubled, and yet he overcame. 
and he's let us know that we too could overcome the world. Now Jesus, of course, was troubled whenever he came to the tomb of Lazarus in St. John chapter 11. The Bible says that Jesus was troubled in his spirit. In verse 21, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I send you that one of you, uh, I excuse me, I was reading the wrong verse. He says in verse number uh, 35, Jesus wept. The preceding verse, though, says uh, that uh, Jesus was troubled. Verse 33, when J Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. That's the verse I wanted to read concerning Lazarus. And then, of course, uh, Jesus was troubled when he considered the cross. The word of God says, now is my soul troubled in St. John 12, verse 27. And then, of course, uh, the scripture I read there accidentally about Judas betraying him. The Bible says that Jesus was troubled in spirit. Our own Savior was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He faced trouble. And, of course, in our lives, he said that every one of us would have tribulation. It doesn't have to be the tribulation period for Christians to face tribulation. Isn't that right? Some people think this is the tribulation period. We, I don't believe it is, but uh, you don't have to be in the tribulation period to have tribulation. And you don't have to be, uh, you know, alive very long until you face some trouble. And Jesus himself, the Son of God, faced trouble, but he overcame that trouble because of knowing the Father's purpose for his life and knowing the will of God for what was going on. He was troubled because of his friend Lazarus. As a man, and the, the manly side of Jesus, you might would say, or the manward side of Christ, uh, that he wept over Lazarus, letting us know that it's right for us to grieve and to weep over those who have passed on and those who have lost their lives in this terrible coronavirus and we weep over them the bible says to weep with them that weep and jesus did he wept with those who were grieving but then he raised lazarus from the dead and he wept of course because of the cross and the fact that he would die upon the cross and ask the father if it would pass from him and then the word of god also says that he wept because of the betrayal of judas but the word of god teaches us that on this time that we read saint john chapter 14 he is comforting the hearts of his disciples. He's the one that's going to suffer, but his concern was for the welfare of his followers, for those that were with him in the upper room. And so he began to give them this message. He said to them, of course, that he would go away and prepare a place for them. And we read it there a moment ago. We've heard it so many times. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And he said, if I go away, I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm going to come again. Uh, we can be comforted this morning. We can allow our hearts to be filled with the peace of God's word instead of being troubled because we know for one thing that he said he's going to come back again. The Jamaicans have a little song that says, uh, he went away but not to stay, he's coming back again. Uh, we can rejoice this morning. I think we ought to stop and rejoice a little bit. Maybe you could stick your hand out the car window or something, but give God the glory. The one who went away is coming back again. Can you say amen? He is the Son of God, and he comes to bring peace to people's lives. And to his own disciples, he brought them such a great peace by letting them know that heaven is a very real place. He let them know, he said to them, uh, that uh, it's going to take a prepared people to be able to go to a prepared place. Heaven is a prepared place, and it's going to be a prepared people that actually go to heaven. In the Bible, we see that heaven is referred to sometimes as a country because of its vastness. Sometimes heaven is referred to as a city because of its inhabitants. Sometimes it's called a kingdom because of the ruler and its order and Christ being king. Sometimes it's called a paradise because of its beauty. And sometimes it's called a house because of its family. And it is the Father's house. And Jesus let us know that by knowing the Father is the way for us to overcome trouble and to have peace. That's how Jesus was able to do what he did to fulfill the Father's will because he and the Father were one. He knew the Father. And the greatest thing that could happen to Christians today is to be reintroduced to the Father God and to Jesus Christ and to the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the Blessed Trinity. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, we are in this world, but we are not alone in this world. God is with us. And we can have our hearts to be settled before God, even at a time like this. The Lord let us know that in the last days that perilous times would come. He told us that ahead of time, which brings us immense blessing, even though it seems to be very fearful in some ways. The fact that he told us ahead of time lets us know he's prepared for it and he's preparing us for whatever may take place. 
We can be glad today that he is preparing a place for us and he's made a way that all sinners that will call upon him can make heaven their home. Jesus says in this passage of scripture, of course, that we read, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man cometh unto the Father but by me. For those that are listening today who are not saved, those who are not Christians that wonder about all these things that are going on, it's just another opportunity by the grace of God uh, for people to be able to come to Christ. Somebody said, well, people have been preaching all my life that Jesus was coming and he hasn't come back yet. And the Bible says it's not because of slackness. It's not because that God doesn't like the power to bring Jesus back. It's because of his mercy and his love that he wants as many people to come into the things of God as possible. The fact that he's tarried to this hour and these things are going on in this earth is a sign to every man, woman, and boy and girl. It's time to prepare to meet God and to call upon Jesus. The only way that you're going to have the peace of God is to have peace with God. And if people will make peace with God today by calling on Jesus Christ as their Savior, we will be able to face anything that comes our way knowing that he's prepared a place for us and that he's going to come again and receive us unto himself. There is a church in Strasbourg, Germany that on the dial of the clock, they've got the words written that says, one of these hours, the Lord is coming. I don't know the hour, I don't know the day, but I know this, on the clock, when you see the face of that clock with those 12 numbers, and one of those hours, one of these days, Jesus is coming back again, can you say amen? And all of these things he told us aforetime, and Jesus says to them in this passage, if you read this whole chapter, he said, I told you these things before, so that when they come to pass, you'll know that I was doing what the Father called me to do. And I'm here to tell you, these things are coming to pass. Some of us preached them for many years. Reverend Price right here preached many, many years and talked about the coming of the Lord. Now, a lot of us, I've been preaching 40 years about the coming of the Lord. But the passing of the time does not diminish the power of God. He is able to come and he is going to come. The Bible says, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Uh, he's tarried a long time. And sometimes we say, if the Lord tarry. But there's coming a day when there'll be no more tarrying. Can you say amen? Jesus of Nazareth is coming again. And that's why we invite everybody to call upon Christ and to know him for themselves. The Bible says he will receive all those who have received him. The Bible says when he goes away and prepares a place, he said that I will receive you unto myself. Christ will receive all those that have received him. So we challenge those over Facebook, over live stream, over YouTube. We challenge people everywhere, right here and abroad, wherever they may be, to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I come across a quote by James Merritt. He said, you can be a Buddhist without knowing Buddha. You can be a Muslim without knowing Mohammed. You can be a Confucius without knowing Confucius, but you cannot be a Christian without knowing Christ. Can you say amen? amen. And thank God you can know him by his spirit. He will reveal himself. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the Bible says, you will be saved. Thank God. And today we want to call upon him and believe God uh, in everything that he said here in this passage. Jesus also promised to reveal the Father. He said he'd prepare a place for us and come for us. He said he would reveal the Father to them. Now, Philip, he was the one who said, come and see Jesus. He's the one the Gentiles came and said, we'd like to see Jesus. But then when it came to this passage, Philip says, we can't see the Father. But Jesus said, look here, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And if they were looking for something sensational, Jesus said, look here, if you can't believe for any other reason, you ought to believe because of the miracles. How I many of God confirmed Jesus? The Bible says he did mighty signs. He was a man approved of God with mighty signs and wonders. Many people have been on the fence for years and have been saying, well, I don't know if I really believe in God or whether or not I believe in Jesus. Well, I'm here to tell you the things that are coming on this world are just like what God said. Uh, God has proven himself. There's no doubt about it. There's a great big wonderful God that sits high and looks low and his name is Jesus and Jesus is at his right hand and there's coming a day when he's going to tell him to come back for his church and I challenge you to become a part of the church of Jesus Christ uh, the blood washed believers uh, that have called upon his name are the ones that are going to go to be with him and those that know him of course are going to know the father there will be no doubt about it and the Bible says also that he granted them in this passage he says in verse number 12 verily verily I send you he that believeth on me the works I do uh, that I do shall he do also and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my father and whosoever uh, you shall ask him, or whatsoever rather, you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. 
Now, this is one of the things that would keep them from being troubled is that they can pray. We call on America to pray now and to pray in the name of Jesus. We're not praying in the name of a denomination. We're not praying in the name of some big preacher. Let me tell you, there are no big preachers and no small churches. Right. Every church that is a church that honors God is a church that is there for God's glory. Uh, that church has a candlestick before the throne of God. And I'm, let me tell you, no matter how big a preacher he is, he's not as big as he thinks he is. It wouldn't take much at all to get him in a position where he couldn't do anything. Uh, we can't do anything without Jesus Christ this morning. Isn't that true? Amen. But he gave them this ability to be able to pray. And he said, when you pray this way, ask anything in my name and I will do it. Dr. P.C. Nelson said he was one of the great uh, theologians of our time in the 20th century particularly. And he was one of those who had such ability with language. When he was asked about this by one of his students, whenever he was teaching Greek, uh, they said, you know, what does that really mean then? What is it that, uh, and he actually used this passage to say this is why he enjoyed reading his Bible in Greek. He said, if you could read this in Greek, it really says, ask anything in my name. If I don't have it, I'll make it for you. And today we're glad our God can still do whatever necessary. That he said, ask anything in my name and I will do it. Amen. Not only that, he said, I will send them the Holy Spirit. He said, I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter. This is what was going to keep them from being upset and troubled, knowing that they would have another comforter. Now they were, of course, uh, very emotional because Jesus said to them he was getting ready to go away. But he said, this is the thing. He said, you're going to have the comforter to abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. The world can't receive it because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. He said, I'm going to come to you through the presence of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be left on your own. And brethren, I'm here to tell you, God has not advocated his throne. The Holy Spirit has not went anywhere. Even though all these things are going on in America and around the world, I'm here to tell you, God is still on the scene. His presence is real in the lives of believers everywhere. Uh, we sense his wonderful presence. We know that God is real and his power is available to all that call upon his name. We reject unbelief. We reject anything that comes against us. We're holding on to the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. Last of all, you'll notice he said that he granted him, uh, granted them his peace. In St. John 14, 27 through 31, he says to them, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. These are the reasons why the disciples could be at peace. And, and remember this, he's speaking to the ones that he's called on to go out into all the world. And pretty much everybody that he's speaking to is going to be martyred for the cause of Christ. But he says to them, don't be afraid. Don't let your heart be troubled. Hallelujah. <laughs> what a mighty word this is from Christ to his disciples. And then he says in the midst of that, he says to them, in verse number 30, he says, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. And whenever I studied that out and did the word study, I found out uh, that when Jesus said that the devil's coming, I'm not going to talk more, much more with you. He did give them a bit more after that, of course, in the upper room. Uh, but when he says he has nothing in me, I found out that that means that Satan has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There's nothing in me that belongs to him, and he has no power over me. Amen. That's what Jesus said to his own disciples. What a comforting word. What a, what a word of victory that he said, look here, the devil is coming. Things are going to get rough. And he knew what he was going to pass through and that he was going to die on the cross. But he says, look here, the devil has no claim on me. I, he has nothing in common with me. There's nothing in me that belongs to him, and he has no power over me. Uh, this is your confession of faith. As we face this world and this month of April, as we have this executive order that we can't gather together the way we normally do, let me tell you, the word of God has not changed. And that the word is still true, that you and I as believers can say, look here, the devil has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There's nothing in me that belongs to him, and he has no power over me. That makes me happy. That makes me want to shout. Can you say amen? Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Jesus said, my father is greater than all. Amen. 
Yeah. Uh, while he was in that limited condition where he had allowed himself to be limited to the conditions of humanity, he said, Our, my Father is greater than all. We know that Jesus is equal with the Father, but for that one moment in time, he says, My Father is greater than all. And today, brethren, we broadcast it live and loud. We're preaching the gospel with a loudspeaker saying that our God is greater than all of our enemies. He's greater than all of the opposition. He's going to finish what he started. He didn't bring us this far to leave us. He's going to do everything that he said he was going to do. And he's going to bring forth the kind of revival and anointing that people need in their lives. We expect God to move in a mighty way. Can you say amen? We expect God to heal right here over Facebook, right over uh, live stream or YouTube or whatever else is going on. We're believing God to meet needs right where you are. Let's bow for a moment for prayer and ask God for those that are listening today that God would bless and minister to them. And let's pray together. Our Father God, we thank you for this privilege to have presented the gospel. Thank you that we don't have to be troubled and we don't have to be afraid. Thank you for the peace of God, Father God, that passes all understanding that is ruling in our hearts and minds and father we pray that you would just bring peace to those that are watching father god we pray for those right here in our parking lot today god we ask that you would just minister